a couple things before we get started on this video. I want to let you know that you're much better off if you're using a monitor when watching this video. Don't try to look at it on a phone because there is a portion in the latter half where we are getting into some fairly fine print in order to get a complete table on the screen at once. The other thing to notice, this is part one of three on Avicenna or Abu Ibn Sina, if I'm pronouncing the Arabic original name correctly there. And his dates, you can see 980 to 1037. In part one, we're looking at the metaphysics of the necessity and contingency concepts. And then in part two, we're going to use what we've had in part one for a cosmological argument for the existence of God. And then finally, in part three, we will be drilling in on the nature of causation. And in all three cases, Avicenna is very much following Aristotle. So let's go ahead and look at the background of Avicenna a little bit. Now, he's usually considered one of the, if not the most influential philosophers amongst the Arabic philosophers, and arguably uh, the most influential Islamic philosopher. Now, just to be clear here of the distinction by Arabic philosophers, that would include a group that would have spoken and written in Arabic, but they may be Christian, they may be Jewish uh, or Muslim, they may or may not have been ethnically Arab. And in fact, Avicenna was a Persian. And Avicenna also was, uh, in fact, Muslim. So uh, even though he's representing, he may be the best of the Arabic philosophers, that's a very broad group when we say that. And when we say he may be one of the most or the most influential of the Islamic philosophers, obviously we're, we're limiting that group as well. Now, Avicenna was a trained physician. And so he often would study in the courts of princes, in other words, royalty, the, the most influential people of his time. He read Aristotle's metaphysics 40 times, this is his words, uh, with very little understanding, he said. It was very challenging. And that was before, though, he found a commentator by Al-Farabi, a, a commentary, I should say, by Al-Farabi, which helped him gain insight into Aristotle's work, the metaphysics. Now, this is not uncommon for someone to struggle with the original text of Aristotle and then find a little more insight when they have an instructor, when they have a teacher who's also been struggling through it. That's pretty much the nature of studying Aristotle's metaphysics. So uh, Al Avicenna was primarily interested in metaphysics and that's what we are focusing on in all three parts of our videos here. But he also had this eye toward understanding metaphysics in order to understand humans and, and the role of humans in the universe. First, before we get to his distinctions uh, in modality, let's uh, broadly talk about what modal logic is. So modal logic is the logic of necessity and contingency. So it deals with what is possible, what is impossible, and what must be the case, what is necessary. So consider this kind of claim. All A's are necessarily B's. So we might say something like, all frogs are necessarily amphibians. Well, often this has been interpreted simply as at any time T, all A's at T are B's. Now that would make sense if we're talking about frogs being amphibians. So that, that's perfectly fine. But Avicenna noted that, well, there are some distinctions that are possible here. So there are other possible relations when you say that sentence, all A's are necessarily B's. It could mean at some time during it, its existence, every A is a B. Or it could mean at most times during its existence, 
every A is a B. Or of course, the, the natural interpretation that we had to start with at all times during its existence, every A is a B. So Avicenna said we need to be careful to distinguish these ideas and let's consider the relevance here. Why is this important? Well, if we make this distinction, when we consider this claim, all men are mortal. It seems to be a, a kind of statement that's making a necessary claim. That is the idea that all men are necessarily mortal. Now, that doesn't mean though at any time T that all men die at that time T because mortal means one dies, right? But rather it means at some time during their existence, all men will die. So that, that is an important distinction to make that Avicenna makes. Now, an even more important distinction is this differentiation between essence and existence. So Avicenna distinct, distinguished these two. Essence is what a thing is, right? What it is. Existence, on the other hand, is whether it is, whether it exists or not. And Avicenna talked about the things like a quiddity. Um, I always put an extra uh, syllable in that term. Quiddity is the correct pronunciation, uh, but I've had instructors who would say quiddity, so I've inherited that mistake. In any case, it, quiddity is the essence of a thing. It's nature, what it is, what it has to be. And later, uh, Planiga, Alvin Planiga, took this idea and developed it in very similar ways, right? This nutshell of this idea in his work, The Nature of Necessity, talked about the essence of a thing and used contemporary modal logic to cash out what that means. But that's another story. We're going to stick with Avicenna today. All right, so here's the chart that I mentioned that obviously you're going to have trouble looking at if you're on a phone. So uh, this is where you really need that monitor. So we have two broad categories that we're considering. Existence, these are things that do in fact exist, and then non-existence, things that do not in fact exist. And so we can fill in what we're talking about here. We're distinguishing each of these groups uh, further. Among the existence, we have things that are necessary. These are necessary beings. And among the things that exist, uh, there are also possible beings, but not necessary beings. Now, of the things that don't exist, some of them are, could be possible. So these are possible, but non-existent. These would be speculative kinds of things. And then uh, lastly, there would be things that are not possible at all. So we're not going to have much to say about that group. Okay, again, distinguishing now further in the column of necessary beings, we can separate things that have necessity within themselves. So something that is necessary in itself is distinct from something that's necessary, but doesn't have its necessity from within itself. Obviously, this is a distinction that goes back to Aristotle. Amongst the things that are possible but not necessary, we call those things contingent. And among the things that don't exist but are possible, these things would be contingent if they existed. And then, of course, we're not going to say much about that column on, uh, of the impossible things. So let's further go down these columns. Something that's necessary in itself is uncaused in contrast to something that is necessary but doesn't have its necessity within itself. Those are in fact caused. So something could be caused and necessary, but something could be uncaused and necessary. Now, contingent beings are always caused. So that means in order for the thing to exist, it must have a cause for its existence. So its cause then is going to be hypothetically necessary. In order for it to exist, it must have this other thing that existed that made it exist, was a cause for its existence. 
And amongst those things that are possible but non-existent, they would need a cause in order for them to exist. Now let's go back to think about things that are necessary in itself. These are uncaused, and these are necessary in respect to all aspects of its being. Uh, the things that are possible but not necessary, the contingent things, the quiddity is not sufficient for its existence. There is a quiddity, uh, but it may or may not exist. And we would say the same thing about those things that are non-existent but could exist. The quiddity is not sufficient to make it exist. Whereas with the necessary being that has its necessity within itself, the quiddity is sufficient for its existence. Now we could also say amongst uh, the necessary beings, uh, the first type that have its necessity within itself, these must not be composite. They can't be composed of other kinds of things. They have to be simple, in other words. Those things that are necessary but don't have their necessity within itself are composite in some sense. It's going to have to be qualified in the sense in which it is composite. Uh, the things that are contingent are always going to be composite as, of course, the things that don't exist but could exist, uh, which are composite. Of the necessary beings that have the necessity within itself, they must not have a shared nature. And this is going to be important when we go to part two and consider Avicenna's cosmological argument. Those things that have their necessity from some other source, part or one aspect of their nature could be shared with something else. And then uh, contingent beings have a nature that may be shared. And we would say that, you know, possibly uh, the case of things that don't exist, but could. Those things that are necessary and have the necessity from within in themselves are unchangeable. Uh, things that are necessary, but don't have the necessity from within themselves are changeable in the sense that they can move. And so for Avicenna, that would include celestial bodies. Now, things that are contingent are obviously changeable, and we would say that of those things that may or may not, that don't exist but could exist, those were, are going to be changeable. And then finally, there's only one example of that first column. There's only one thing that has its necessity from within itself and is uncaused. It's not able to share its nature, so that means it's only one. It is unchangeable, and that being is God. And as I suggested, the, something that has its necessity, but not from within itself, uh, for Avicenna's metaphysics could include the celestial spheres, and then uh, things that are contingent are include humans or are the artifacts, artifacts that humans make, tables, and chairs, and of course, any other animal or biological creature. Uh, just an example of something possible that but does not exist would be a unicorn. So we can imagine this kind of thing. It's a speculative category. And then just as one example of something that's impossible and, and does not exist, of course, would be a round square. Other things that are logically incoherent. Okay, so. As I mentioned, we're going to use some of these ideas in part two to construct a cosmological argument for the existence of God. So that's where we will be going in part two.